record it. It's just to oh. kind of catch you candidly. We're just <clears throat> kind of try, trying to encourage you more. So I think you like looking at people. You yeah, <laughs> okay. like some people just look at you look at you as just, oh, he's just the president. You know, it's all business. Yeah. You know, but we want to... that we gave President Kreit a round of applause and we haven't even introduced him yet, so very good. Welcome to a conversation with President Kreit. My name is Professor Caputo. This is my actually my 10th fall teaching and I absolutely love these professional seminars. It gives us a chance to all come together and to learn. So today, uh, what we're gonna do is we have some student panelists they're going to be asking President Kreit questions. But before they do that, just a couple quick announcements. First off, I think it goes without saying, let's be respectful today and put those digital distractions aside. Please turn your cell phones off um, and put them away. Also, um, I wanted to announce that Dean Powell, unfortunately, isn't with us today. He is away on a conference. So if you don't see Dean Powell, that's where he is. But we, we do have a special guest in place. Um, can we get a big round of applause for Vice President Guy Jones, who's with us? And without further ado, let's introduce our special guest. He came to BCU after serving as the Dean at Daniels College of Business at the University of Denver. Let's give a thunderous round of applause to the seventh president of the great Bethune-Cookman University, Dr. LeBrent Kreit. And the good folks asking him questions, let's start right over here. Ashlyn Denson, she's a senior, and you are a broadcast journalism major? Yes. Uh, Yes. We have Mr. Canante Story, public relations major, you're a junior. Yes. And Ms. Sarah Wilson, uh, emphasis in multimedia journalism, and she is also a senior. And I'm going to turn it over to our students right now. Welcome, President Cry. Thank you. Um, thank you for blessing us with your presence. Uh, I know it's been a little difficult. Everybody's always on you. So how, how has it been adjusting? How has your first three months been? Yeah, thank you, first of all, for the invitation. This is such a treat for me. Uh, this is the best part of this job, the opportunity to interact with our students and academic community. So I am, I am just grateful for the, for the opportunity. So I just, I just uh, completed my first uh, quarter here, first three months. Uh, and... Uh, and it, it, it's been um, an absolutely uh, wonderful experience. Um, as I've communicated to some of you, I, I have, just in this very brief period, uh, fallen in love with this place, with this community. Uh, I've been just extraordinarily blessed to uh, have a, uh, a career and to have had professional opportunities that so far exceeded anything that I ever expected coming out of uh, Detroit. Uh, and this is, is in almost every way uh, the penultimate uh, opportunity. And, and there is no place else uh, in the world that I'd, I'd rather be. Uh, there is a lot of work to do here. Uh, I, I am busier than, than I, I think uh, sometimes optimal. And so I don't get the opportunity to spend as much time with students uh, as, as I want, which is why this is such a um, wonderful um, uh, opportunity. So thank you. I am happy to be here and looking forward to the, to the conversation. Uh, good morning, Dr. Craig. Um, just through my experience so far as the student body vice president, I've had an opportunity to see you a lot around campus. And um, in that opportunity, I've seen you, of course, uh, gaze into campus with your wife. So if you don't mind me asking, just tell us a little bit about your family. Sure. So um, my wife Phyllis and I have been married uh, for 33 years. And uh, yeah, I, I know, right? That's a, that's a, that's a big deal. And, and uh, 
And so for you, you, you young men in particular. So, so my, wife and I, my wife and I met, obviously many years ago, we met and uh, six weeks after we met, we were engaged. And while I don't recommend that, um, <laughs> I, 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 do wanna, I do wanna say to our, our, our young men in particular, there's, a, there's, a, there's there are four words that have, uh, have allowed our marriage to thrive and and uh, succeed, and, and we have the strongest marriage that I know of, and we've had commuter, I mean, I've commuted, we've lived on the other side of the country, we've raised three kids, we've got a grandson here with us now, uh, and so there's been difficulty, and yet we, um, and so for you young men in particular, it's just four words. Uh, so this is what you need to remember when you're married and you're wondering... Whatever you say, baby. Whatever you say, baby. Whatever you say, baby. That's it. That's all you need. I'm telling you. When you get married. Smart. Or, or it could be two. Okay, baby. Smart. All right, baby. Young man, I'm telling you, she's the boss. Make no mistake about it. That is as it ought to be. And that is, has been certainly for, the, for us the key to, to marriage. So we have three kids. Two grandkids now. Um, this transition to Daytona has been um, interesting. <laughs> from Definitely. from Denver, uh, while the transition to the university has been just an act of just sheer grace and providence. Florida has been a little bit more of a challenge for us both, <laughs> um, geographically, culturally, aesthetically, uh, and and otherwise. But. Um, but this is, this is part of our journey, and we're excited to be on it together. And so it's a, it's a blessing. Okay, hey, hello, Dr. Kreit, President Kreit. Um, like they said, I'm Ashlyn Denson. So I'm just going to ask you, because I know that there are so many speculations about the roles of the Board of Trustees. So what is your role as the president of this university? Like, what do you do? What does your everyday life consist of? Right. So that's a really good question. And um, as, I, as I interpret it, my role is at least in part to work with our extraordinary and dynamic community that is internal and external stakeholders to harness the vitality and dynamism and potential and history to elevate Bethune-Cookman mm -hmm. University to the next tier of excellence. And so that's pretty easy to say, to harness everything that we are and have been and to enable us to become more. But deciding what more and better is mm -hmm. and deciding what the pathway is and understanding the resources required and understanding how that's consistent with our history and mission, which in many ways may or may not fit with the 21st century market and, and how do we discern that. Those are all parts uh, of, the, um, of the terrain that need to be navigating. Th those are leadership issues. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and so I've surrounded myself with, a, with an outstanding cabinet and rely on the faculty and faculty leadership and the board of trustees. Boards of trustees provide governance and oversight of an institution. Executive and management teams manage and run the institution. And sometimes those lines get blurry. Uh, and in fact, they blurred a little here, uh, which is why we had some of the difficulties we have. But, but we have a new board chair. We've got institutional leadership that you know, we understand the roles. And, and together uh, with the board, uh, there are just uh, uh, there are great things that we're looking to do, but, 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 but ultimately it is to enable um, the success uh, of our students and to create an environment that allows them to lead lives of passion and purpose. And, and, and that is um, sort of summary of the role of, of what I view as. Okay, thank you.
Um, you were, I have seen you speak on multiple platforms and you're pretty big on student engagement. So how, can you tell us a little bit, when you were a student, how were you involved in the student media and what are your thoughts on them being that we are student media ourselves? Yeah, I, I, I absolutely believe in student engagement and for, for lots of reasons. I think, that, I think that the deepest and most critical learning um, is very often going to take place outside of the classroom. Uh, I think that, that at its best, uh, universities like ours operate at this intersection of intellectual rigor, which you get from your wonderful faculty, uh, and, and market relevance by engaging in leadership opportunities, by challenging yourselves, by, by um, uh, developing uh, opportunities to step out of your comfort zone. And, and the reason it's so important at this stage in your lives uh, is because there are, there are virtually no consequences for failure. And, and that is not the case once you leave here, right? I mean, so you start an organization, you assume a leadership role, you take on a project, and it doesn't work. Like, so what? Y you've learned from it. You've grown from it. It becomes part of your personal narrative. You harness it. Uh, you leverage it in interviews. You talk about how this differentiates you. You talk about what you learned from that and what you wouldn't do again and what you would do differently. Those are powerful experiences that in the cumulative uh, will set you up well. Sarah was talking about the... Uh, NABJ. The NABJ, National Association of Black Journalists. And I, she was asking, so how, how can we make this happen? I said, well, you know, surround yourself with a critical mass. I said, you need to at least find one or two people who share your passion. She says she's got a team of three, including her. That's all you need. Make the case, create the value proposition, bring people in, uh, and give them a seat at the table uh, that they can be a part of. Uh, in terms of my own, my own role, look, I, I, I came out of Detroit public schools in the 70s, and, and I, I, I just wanted to get out of Detroit and get, get um, out of that environment, but I was not particularly experienced. I wasn't, I wasn't well prepared. I, I didn't know. Uh, I got to Michigan State and was told unequivocally that, uh, you know, I really didn't belong at Michigan State uh, at that time. And, but, you know, that was, those were different times. Michigan State had obligations to provide remedial education in ways that they do not now, in ways that even we do not now. Uh, and so I didn't come with a sense of self. I had no confidence. I... Um, and so for me, whether it's my fraternity or uh, finding, finding areas of passion that I cared about, uh, challenging myself and, uh, myself and recognizing that this was a uniquely important opportunity to step up, and that was a huge difference in my life. And so I, I can't stress enough to take courses on subjects about which you know nothing. Engage yourself ex in experiences that frighten you. Submit yourself to the opportunities that are uniquely available in a university environment like this. Because um, there's nothing like these years that you'll spend at Bethune Cookman University. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm gonna ask this question because you were saying a lot of great things and I feel like it would tie into this question that I'm gonna ask you now. Um, about stepping outside of your comfort zone, um, doing things is going to get you like that, that experience. So it is widely accepted that students who study abroad are more competitive when they graduate. Many of our students don't get to study in Africa, Brazil, Italy, India, you name it, um, other parts of the world because they don't have the funding. So my question for you is, what are some things you plan to do to provide us with the global learning opportunities? Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. For those of you that know me, uh, or had a chance to talk with, you know that that is near and dear to my heart. And I've spent the last, I don't know, 20 plus years 
providing students with what I view as, as transformational opportunities around the world. And, and these opportunities have been primarily in post center command transition markets uh, as opposed to OECD countries or Western European countries. Um, so the action is in, is in South Asia, the action is in East Asia, the action is in Sub-Saharan Africa, the action is in the Middle East. And, and I, I was attracted to this opportunity in part because I want to ensure that our students have the opportunities that my students uh, at the University of Michigan had, or my students at the University of Denver have, or my students at the University of Arizona has. And so um, you, you need to know that, that providing financial support and raising resources and then creating the infrastructure uh, in terms of our academic portfolio uh, and opportunities to get students uh, overseas and to engage them meaningfully in some of the most dynamic and important parts of the, of the world is a vitally important part of, um, of, of, of our agenda. Uh, but I want to say something else if I can. Providing financial resources for student international travel and providing financial resources for scholarship support are, of course, absolutely vital. Um, but if I, if I can, in, in the spirit of, of full disclosure, you know, I'm, I'm, I am here first and foremost to ensure that we get off probation and survive, period. And, and, and so there's, there's a lot to that. I mean, don't get me wrong. We have huge and aspirational plans, and I, and I can't wait till we can create the narrative around which will enable us to coalesce on those plans. But our first order of business is to get out of sacks, to get this monkey off our back so that we can do the business of restoring the great Bethune-Cookman University to its rightful place. And so, and, and so I, I, I just want to make sure that we're clear on the order of things before you ask me, well, can I get to Africa next week? Uh, 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 or something like that. So um, that's... That's what we're focused on uh, at, uh, at this point. You spoke about um, finances. Mm -hmm. um, touching on finances, you mentioned your focal points already for where you're trying to give more financial footing. So what are kind of your focal points as far as department-wise? Being that MassCom, well, School of Performing Arts, Mass Communications being under that umbrella is the fifth largest school on the campus, how can we be a part of that focal point as well as far as financial footing um, to help with more, putting more services and programs for MassCom. Sure. Well, so you're also in the largest um, academic unit on campus mm -hmm. as well. And so one of the things that, so we, we chartered um, a, uh, a faculty, a group of faculty, faculty needs, and the first meeting is today, this afternoon. And, and this group of faculty um, you know, I asked them along with the provost to come together for the sole function of helping us to reimagine and refine our academic portfolio. Um, we have amazing professors and a, a wonderful and eclectic mix of um, academic programs. <clears throat> but this is a university that at best is 36, 3,700 students. We really shouldn't get beyond that. We're at 2,900 now. I have no doubt we'll grow. We just hired an amazing, thank goodness, enrollment management professional. That's the final member of our cabinet um, who will start. He's here on campus now. So that's going to be huge. <clears throat> but we have, I don't know, 10 or 11 academic units, I think. Something like that. It's a lot. And so I've asked the faculty to come together to help us think about how we can more effectively align academic structure with institutional strategy. And from there, uh, we can then be much more effective in allocating resources and looking at opportunities for investment and focusing on the things that, that we want to focus on. At our heart, 
we are a, a liberal arts institution. And, and that's a great thing. And so how do we use liberal arts as a basis to then ensure that our students have the fluencies, the competencies, the experiences, the skills in vitally important areas, whether it's STEM or STEAM or health science or liberal arts or engineering. Uh, and and this, is, this is the opportunity uh, for us. And I'm, I'm really excited about that. But it starts with the faculty taking, taking uh, a shot at, at really recalibrating what the academic portfolio looks like. And I'm really excited about that work. So I know that we've heard you speak on um, your intake on the North Star, making our institution and the students the North Star. Now, how do you project our enrollment for the next three to five years at this institution? Sure, sure. That's a, that's a great question. So when I got here, we began to calibrate. I mean, part of our challenge was that we weren't aligning our expense budget with revenue streams, right? We had more expenses than we had revenues, and that's never sustainable. And so we came in here and, and we thought that with all of the noise in the press and all the media attention and everything else that was going on, that we estimated that we could build a budget around, we estimated that we would get 2,600 students because it, it was just tough, right? And so we built a budget around that. Uh, tough, tough to do that at 2,600. But that's what we built and that's what we were working toward. And if we said we can get 2,600, okay, here's going to be the gap. Here's what we need to do. But we will align our expense side of the, of the um, balance sheet with this revenue stream. So we came in, not at 2,600, but at 2,900. Even after taking, as you know, a tougher stance than we had historically in terms of requiring our students being financially clear, right? Which was, which was difficult. But we had no choice. This is a private university. And, and, and so, so the fact that we exceeded by 300 students, our budgeted enrollment, the fact that I now have a sense of really just how great this place is, the fact that we now have a vice president of marketing and a vice president of enrollment management, I have every expectation that we will get to 31 or 3,200 next year, 32, 33 the following year, and that we will grow predictably and sustainably till we hit that 35 to 3600 mark. For three, four years ago, I know we were at 41, but 4100 might sound good, but it's, it's too large for our infrastructure. We don't deliver world-class education at 4100 students. And we certainly didn't have 4,100 students who were able to fulfill their financial obligations. And it was wrong to pursue that large cohort. But it looks good though, right? Mm. And so we're not gonna make that mistake. We're gonna gradually and incrementally manage our enrollment activities just as we did this year. And my view is that if we can do it this year, which was just, oh my goodness, tough then I have no doubt uh, that we'll be able to do it consistently um, for the foreseeable future. And then you align your expense budget with the revenues. And that's just like basic financial management 101 that makes sure that your revenues <coughs> exceed your expenditures. That's what we'll do. Okay, so um, you were talking about enrollment management. So I wanted to ask, um, what are the... Pl what are your plans, um, or do you have any plans to make enrollment requirements of this institution more rigorous, while at the same time honoring, the, honoring our, our historical responsibility to provide educational opportunity to students who may be less you know, well prepared when they graduate from high school? I know, right? Students like me, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? right. Mm -hmm. uh, I think about that every day. Mm -hmm. so, so that is what we refer to as a sort of bimodal demand curve, right? Uh, by modal distribution of students. Um, and I think it's absolutely compatible. Uh, that dynamic, is, is, this is not a binary notion. This is not mutually exclusive. Uh, I, I, I love, I am here because of that mission. 
Mm. Uh, I'm here because I've seen some of the extraordinary talent, the exceptional students at Bethune-Cookman University, and I, I'm inspired by them and amazed by them. And I've also seen students who are like me, <laughs> who, who maybe don't know their potential, maybe haven't had the background. Um, and, and I am passionate about making sure that we, that we support and serve them as well. But I, I want to be clear about this. And this is not unique to Bethune-Cookman University. But the overwhelming majority of colleges and universities are in the midst of an incredible inflection period. The market, the demand pressures, the new entrance, price point divergence, um, arguments about value propositions plaguing, are plaguing higher education. For institutions like ours that have been historically resource constrained, the consequences of that discussion are particularly important. So our obligation is to strengthen the enterprise for all of our students. And I think we can be much stronger in terms of how we prepare students for the rigors of a global, increasingly entrepreneurial market space. Mm -hmm. And um, so that is, that is what we're, we're committed to doing. Would I like to, would I like to be able to, to go after uh, stronger students? Of course, like who, who doesn't? But I, but I expect to continue to do that, but I expect to continue to serve um, that vital portion of, of our community while simultaneously increasing uh, the rigor and caliber of the academic enterprise. Look, Michigan State saved my life. I mean, that is not hyperbole. Right? If you look at my siblings and the divergence, and it was all because of education. And so, so what we do here is not, it's not abstract, right? It's not conceptual. Uh, I know the role that we play in developing uh, talent and ability and closing the gap between that ability and talent and access and opportunity, uh, and I wouldn't want to change it. But at the same time, we just need to be better. And we know what that looks like. And, and it starts with this faculty committee and hiring the right people and doing the right thing and, and having a relentless and sustained focus on our North Star, on the student experience. That is what we're going to do. Still touching on enrollment for a little bit, um, little birdie told me that you love golf, and I just so happen to be the next Tiger Woods, if you didn't okay. know. <laughs> um, <laughs> but with our enrollment dropping from last semester to this semester, how, how can you project how it will affect our athletic division as far as D1 and D2, if it will switch? Did that affect it? I know, so, uh, but it's really sensitive terrain around here. Um, let me just be as declarative on this as I, pos as I can. There, there are no plans, uh, nothing in the works, no discussions, no intention of going to D2 to any sports. Um, but we are having necessary conversations with our athletic program about what they can do um, to ensure that we can create, again, a structure that is aligned with institutional resources and institutional strategy. Um, and there is nothing off the table. And, and I, and I want to I say this. Um, there are a lot of wonderful legacy activities around here, whether it's, whether it's our band, whether it's our athletic programs, whether it's corral, whether it's some other things. Um, but I am here to serve this institution. And so we're going to make the decision that we need to make to ensure that the institution can thrive. And, I, and I've been... I have been really pleased and inspired by the response of everyone that has had to come to the table. Now, these are really hard conversations. Um, and in that sense, um, you know, we have to be careful about how we have them and how we curate them. But there is no, alter <laughs> there is no alternative 
but to have those conversations. And so that's what we'll, that's what we'll do. Now, we know a tough conversation is becoming that the generation is slowly changing. Uh, we know that Bethune-Cookman University is very unique for its faith-based um, opportunities and also its historical landmark. And when we think about the generation change, we know that fewer amount of college students or high school students are attending college. Now, what do we do as an institution to make sure that we promote uh, higher education right. at our institution? Right. That's a great point. Yeah, the demographics are tough. And actually, as you may not know, I mean, HBCUs and institutions like ours, we're actually, we, the, the trend lines are actually more favorable for us. They have a lot to do with climate issues and other things than we're seeing in some other places. But, but you're, you're quite right. Uh, and if we were in the Northeast or the Midwest, I mean, it would be tough because there, there are less students going to high school and, and, and then you've got a lot of parents and pundits questioning the value of higher education. But this is when I say the inflection point. This is why first and foremost, in my view, that we have to be much clearer as an institution as to our value proposition. And, and we need to do better with that. And then we need to, to create the materials and the collateral and ensure that the experience is such that students and their parents and our external partners, hiring partners, corporate partners, recognize that what we do here is, is special. So, um, and, and so here's a, here's a data point. We look appropriately at graduation rates and how many degrees we give and how successful students are in terms of matriculating. And that's, and that's wonderful. But my question is, well, how, value, how valuable is the degree that we're, that we're giving? Mm. I mean, I love the fact that you get a degree. I love the fact that our faculty focus on get them through, get them a degree. My question is, are we ensuring that the degrees we grant are proxy indicators of your ability to become a value creator in today's marketplace? And I would suggest that the answer to that uh, is unclear. <laughs> and that in some areas of study, yeah. But in others, I wonder, can you really go out and get the kind of job you want to get studying this? And so that's what we need to do. And once we, once we clarify that and articulate it and make it part of the institutional's the institution sort of ethos, right, the, the mm -hmm. culture. And I don't mean the culture policies and procedures, but I mean the culture is like a Bethune-Cookman. This is the water we swim in. This is our culture. Once we do that, like, we're going to be great because this is a special place. Uh, and, uh, and again, that's why I'm, that's why I'm here. And uh, that's, how I, that's how I try to think about that. Okay, so... One more question for you, President Cry. So everyone is on, uh, everyone across the globe is on social media, you know, right. interacting. Ever since President Barack Obama, every even U.S. presidents are on social media, Twitter, Facebook, tweeting. So, have you thought about possibly using social media to um, further engage with the students here at Bethune Cookman? Yes. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, <laughs> tweet a little bit. Me yeah. a couple on that. Look, I, I, am, um, I, I understand fully the power of, uh, of social media. Uh, I, have, I have been, I'm one of the ones that have, have been uh, not slow to embrace it. I mean, the only social media account I have is a LinkedIn account. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so there is, no, there is no doubt that I need to do I need to do much better. Uh, and fortunately, Mr. Jones, Vice President Jones, uh, is far more fluent in those things than I, <laughs> than I am. Uh, so, so that is an area, that is a, that is a gap that I need to, I need to fill. Uh, and uh, I will be looking for, for his guidance uh, and yours in terms of what that might look like. But I will, I will admit, uh, that, is, that is not a, a, a comfort zone for me. It's not something that I've been, I mean, my kids are just off the chart and their stuff, and maybe that's been the turnoff for me, seeing how much time they, they spend on them. But, 
but I but I understand the the, the power of it, and it's something that uh, that I'll make sure that 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 I correct. Uh, even though, uh, if you all if, if having this conversation with you all is the highlight, that to me is on the opposite end of the spectrum. But maybe it's just because I haven't learned to uh, to appreciate it yet. So I, I appreciate that question. I can get you some Twitter followers. I can get you some uh, followers. Yeah, no can doubt. Set it up yeah, now. No I, doubt. I think no I can doubt. speak for our students when I say, if you need any help. Just, just yeah, ask right, okay. <laughs> All right, we're, we're about five minutes away from finishing up, so what we're going to do is we're going to turn to some of the questions that you guys wrote down when you first walked in, and um, I just picked a few of them out that I think the, the president would be interested in. Here's one about the student center. There have been many rumors that a student center would be created. We as students need an area dedicated to us, and I know that you'd said that your first priority is getting us back financially well and, and, and um, getting us off probation, but where does the student center factor into all this? Is that, that even Starbucks. a priority? Yeah, it's an absolute priority. And, um, you know, you all probably know that in the last, uh, about five, six years ago, the planning stages with this new, with, with the dorms that went up, I mean, the I mean, there was a student center that was a part of that, and the, the trustees and the university went a different direction. And, um, and, and look, our students deserve better. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so we are absolutely committed to providing the kind of space, social, cultural, and otherwise, that can engage you as part of your academic experience here at BCU. Um, but I, I do want to be candid in that we simply cannot access the debt market any further at this point. And even if we could, after everything that we've been through, we probably would not want to use debt to pay for anything. Uh, and so there are some other things that we have to do first. Uh, and um, so, so there, there probably would not be anything immediate in terms of major new construction or infrastructure enhancement. But uh, I go over there pretty regularly and I'm, I'm fully aware of, um, of, of what it's lacking. And so that is, that is front of mind for us. All right, and this is the last question. And I'm gonna paraphrase a little bit here, but it's a really good question. Um, you know, there was a lot of negativity here. What brought you here? You could have mm -hmm. probably picked a lot of other jobs, uh, maybe some much easier, but wh why BCU? Yeah, I appreciate that. You know, the, the, the articles, the media, the noise was actually awful coming out of, out of Denver when I was interviewing. And, and I'd gotten a news feed, a little Google feed, that every time something came out, and something came out almost daily. To the point that, honestly, my wife and I they scheduled our interview. We were down here for a board meeting in um, another part of Florida, and we were just like, like it would be rude not to go. It's only three finalist slots, and we're down here, so let's go. But, you know, we're going to tell the trustees, we're going to tell the trustees during our exit interview that we just can't do it. It's just, it's just too much. And you're right, we had corporate offers. We had other... I mean, I can run a business school in my sleep, and that, that was. And so we were going to tell the trustees that we just, thank you, lovely experience, we just can't do it. And that was the plan for the first half of the day. And then we spent 90 minutes with students, and then we spent another hour with the faculty. And so... You know, that's why we're here. Because of the students, because of the faculty that have committed themselves to you. Because I am at the stage in my life, and my wife and I are at the stage in our lives, where the consequentiality of what we do matters more than anything else. And because the difficulties of this institution were caused by inadequate suboptimal leadership and so high integrity forward thinking transparent leadership is what's necessary to get it out um, and uh, so that's why we're here um, and that's 
why I, I coined this North Star term, and I did coin it, but apply it. Because as long as we remain relentlessly focused on our students, to the point that every decision we make, every argument we have, every counterpoint that's on the table, the question is, so how does this benefit our students? And like, if there's not an unambiguous and direct connection with that, then we just don't need to do it. So that's what we're trying to inculcate here. Um, and um, that's why we wanted to be here. Well, Dr. Craig, I, I speak for everybody in this room. I, we're blessed to have you. You seem to be the perfect person for the job, and we thank you very much. Can we give our president a big round of applause, folks?